G'day everyone, I am the man called Kim Osabi, the man with the plan from the land down under, and I'm creating a comic. The company men, Dead White and Blue, is a 60-page full-color comic about a CIA-run metahuman strike force burned by their own agency while operating in the Middle East, and they fight to clear their name and stop an imminent terrorist attack. This comic is the first issue of an exciting, action-packed new IP that mixes the action of Suicide Squad with the intrigue of Homeland, Body of Lies, and Copra. With art by some of the best indie talent in South America, and a script by me, this comic promises to be the breakout hit of 2021. The sign-up page link for the campaign is in the description below. Backers who sign up go in the running for the chance to win original art pages from the comic itself. I hope you'll be motivated to join me on this journey, to trust me with a portion of your time, your money, and in return, I'll make the best comic book I can, in the hope it entertains you in a way modern comics so often fail to do. G'day everyone, I am the man called Kim Osami, the man with the plan from the land down under, and this is my review of Transhuman, Rivka's Story, by Stephen Cock and Alan Sands. This book was funded on the Kickstarter platform. I backed the campaign and received the book early for review purposes. The story begins with Rivka and her team assaulting a warehouse full of suited gunmen. We're dropped right into the middle of the action here. No explanation or winding exposition. We get guns, gangsters and grenades on page one. Rivka's transhuman enhancements give the edge in battle, using enhanced hearing to detect approaching enemies, calculating gunfire trajectory and punching through cover with her bionic arm. Her team kills or subdues all the targets and Rivka reports the victory into home base, only to be ordered back immediately. She's told the reason is her daughter. We cut forward several years to a well-written pair of alternating scenes. A Steve Jobs type innovator and spokesperson, Professor Kim, lectures on the advantages of transhumanism, replacing damaged or deficit parts for man-made superior ones, before positing that transhumanism is the next step in human evolution, allowing mankind to access ears that hear on frequencies we currently cannot, or eyes that view the ultraviolet spectrum. Simultaneously, Father Stanton preaches on the divinity of mankind's creation, the idea that we are all wonderfully and fearfully made, in God's image. While Professor Kim wants to push humanity into new territory, Father Stanton believes it lessens mankind to undo the work God has done in us. As the father finishes his sermon and thanks the parishioners for their attendance and support, a disgruntled man pulls a gun and tries to kill Professor Kim. Kim is saved by Rivka, now working as his bodyguard. It's clear that Rivka's enhancements allow her to protect her client, creating a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. The priest talks with Robert, a member of his congregation who has just returned from serving overseas in the Special Forces. The priest encourages Robert to stand up against the post-humanism and then invites him to watch a TV interview he is appearing on later that week. Rivka asks Professor Kim why he makes public appearances if it's so dangerous to him. He says these appearances make it easier for his company to get grants to continue developing transhuman enhancements. We learn more about Rivka. She is ex-Israeli military, wounded in combat and given the best transhuman parts to replace her lost extremities. She also lost a daughter to Tay-Sachs disease, caused by faulty genetics passed down through her DNA. Rivka blames herself. Robert tries to have a family lunch after church, but loses his temper and storms out when his wife questions if they can afford the meal. The next few pages are a blur of Rivka's life as she works for and protects the professor. During her off hours, she dodges calls from her husband, who is seeking a divorce so they can both move on with their lives, and uses her augmentations to block out sight and sound and plunge herself into a sleep in an attempt to hide from the nightmares that plague her. Nightmares of her daughter dying before her, and nightmares of how she lost her arm, eye, and hearing. The day of the interview arrives. The priest and the professor argue over the ramifications and impact of transhumanism, with neither side gaining a distinct high ground before the host ends the show. Robert turned up, ostensibly to support Father Stanton, but as the professor heads outside to have a cigarette, Robert tases Rivka and him. He abducts the professor and stashes him in his father's cabin on the outskirts of town. He offers the priest a lift and convinces him to come and see something at that same cabin. Rivka awakens and uses the homing beacon she gave the professor at the conference to begin tracking him down. Within the cabin, an armed Robert wants to force a reckoning between the two sides of the debate, even as, unknown to him, Rivka draws closer. This results in a showdown of ideologies, of man versus more than man, of action versus words. The final scene in this comic makes it clear that Rivka's story is the first part of a much larger world, a much larger narrative that Stephen has planned out. This is a very realistic, very believable and very grounded comic. Everything seen here feels like it could be possible in the next five to ten years. This is the very definition of near-future sci-fi, of speculative fiction. I praised Stephen's other books. Both issues of Terra Olympus are smart, hard sci-fi, and with Transhuman he's added another entry to that list. Stephen's obviously done his research and his engineering background once again comes into play. 
I reckon Stephen is something of a daydreamer or a lateral thinker. He thinks broadly and has taken into account many of the impacts and implications of transhumanism is already starting to present in our society. Another element of this book that was present the whole way through is Stephen's ability to show both sides of an argument without taking a side or vilifying the side he personally disagrees with. This is a skill writers from the big two once to have, but have long forgotten. This isn't propaganda, this is the devil's advocate a knowledgeable writer presenting two sides of the debate. While I suspect which side of the argument Stephen might land on, that's more to do with what I know about him personally, not the viewpoints he has put forward in his story. Going just off the story itself, there's no way I could tell which side Stephen sympathises with more. As smart and sharp as the story is, the art doesn't live up to the script. It does support the mundane nature of the story, and by that I mean the very real-life elements. There's no spandex or capes here. Transhuman elements don't make people into superheroes. Everyone wears regular clothing and operates in a regular world. Unfortunately, there are some weak artistic elements, undetailed backgrounds, muddy colours, problems with perspective and proportion that plague the book from page one. The mundane style enhances the realism of the story, but at the same time, when noticed, these weak elements pull the reader from the story and remind you that you're reading a comic book. The illusion is broken. The art relies heavily on textures and the colourists to give it depth and detail. During the combat scenes there is a strong sense of movement being conveyed and the motion and flow of the fights from panel to panel is easy to follow and understand. Characters are distinct and easily recognisable. With a small cast it's unlikely you'll mistake one character for another. I know that Steven is a sort of writer that sets up elements now that pay off later. I've seen it in Terra Olympus, and I can see elements in this book that can translate into plot points in future books. I also know as an engineer who is a world builder, and he will have thought out and planned details that we as readers might never be aware of, but act as support structures for the story he is actively telling on the page. I do feel like there was an opportunity to strengthen the narrative here, the idea that those people disgruntled with transhumanism have reasons beyond the religious. The problem with the religious angle is that it relies very much on the idea that God created man in his image. Anyone who isn't Christian probably doesn't hold that view anymore. The world is becoming less religious in many ways. The biblical argument against transhumanism won't sway large swaths of people. Even the theory of evolution undermines the created in God's image idea and answers the professor's argument that transhuman is the next step in human evolution. In a world where many people just accept the idea that mankind evolved from apes, invoking Genesis would only affect people who believe as you do. Essentially, you'd be preaching to the choir. Robert's hate for transhumans, then, is baffling. It might be that he was swept up in the fervour of the priest's preaching, but Father Stanton never called for violence. I think there was the opportunity to go a little deeper here, thematically. Robert is having trouble finding and keeping work since he returned from overseas, but it's not really shown why. His outburst makes me think that he's having trouble controlling his temper and his emotions. I don't know if Stephen has something like this in mind, but I think I would have laid the story out like this. Robert returns from his time in the military with some sort of disease or mental illness that inhibits his ability to get and hold a job and makes home life difficult for him and his family. He sees the transhumans and is jealous of them for how easily their lost limbs and missing organs can be replaced and can be improved upon. Many people treat transhumans like celebrities, lauding them as heroes. Robert misses out on job after job to transhuman vets who get preferential treatment because their wounds of war are more visible than his. Just like Rivka's daughter, there is no cybernetic or implant that can treat his illness. Robert might even lament that if he'd been physically wounded he'd still be more of a man because at least then he'd have a job. I might even have Robert lose out on the bodyguard job to Rivka, so he has a reason to be angry at her personally. He comes home and his wife has taken the kids and left him. Angry, he heads to church. He hears the anti-transhuman message and wants to push the idea, but the priest refuses to advocate for violence. Someone overhears him and invites him to a meeting of the Pure Group, where he meets like-minded people who want to take the fight to the transhumans. He is either tasked with kidnapping the professor, the taser meant that he planned this out ahead of time, or he suggests the idea and is denied before he goes off and does it on his own. This setup clearly shows a line of cause and effect from Robert returning home to him deciding to take this extreme action. It also sets up a chance for him to see the error of his ways and work towards some kind of redemption. Ultimately, I can't know what Stephen has planned, and this is all conjecture on my part. I guess I'll have to wait for Transhuman 2 to find out what's next in this realistic hard sci-fi story that seems just around the corner from today.